brings us to item 10, which is the submission on the Land Transport Management Bill. I um, ask Danny Gardner, Michael Byrne, Stephanie Wright and Anna Bray to come up, please. Councillors, I bring your attention to the handout that's on everyone's table, which is the timeline of the decision making over the, the uh, fuel tax. Today we are discussing the council's submission to the bill. We're not discussing the rights or wrongs of the fuel tax per se. That is coming up in the dates you see on the handout that is before you. Okay, no one got any questions on that? Excellent. Danny, well, you are very capable hands. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, we're here today to seek the governing body's approval of an Auckland Council submission on the Land Transport Management Regional Fuel Tax Bill. This bill passed its first reading on the 28th of March and was referred to the Finance and Expenditure Select Committee. It proposes to introduce a mechanism under which regional fuel taxes can be established in order to enable regions to fund transport infrastructure programs that would otherwise be delayed or not funded. It's enabling legislation only. A, scheme, a particular RFT scheme is only triggered by a proposal prepared by a regional council, consulted on and approved by the Ministers of Transport and Finance. It's initially only available to Auckland and to other regional councils from the 1st of January 2021. So just to be clear, what we are here to discuss today is the Council's submission on the design of the legislation and whether it achieves its policy intent. The question of whether Auckland Council should have an Auckland Council regional fuel tax, and if so, what that scheme should contain is a separate uh, conversation and decision. And you have um, the paper before you that's been handed out with the timeline for the uh, discussions and decisions on that proposal. So this is just um, the question of the submission on the design of the legislation. Paragraphs 9 and 10 of the report um, set out the process for establishing the fuel tax as well as the key policy decisions and you're all pretty familiar with those now and we've talked about them before so we won't go through those in detail again. However, I know that you're very interested in the question of exemptions and rebates so we'll work through that again um, briefly. The bill provides that a person is not liable to pay a regional fuel tax in certain circumstances, including where there's an exempt use, as defined by Clause 65A of the legislation. So that uh, will apply where if someone is an ex has an exempt use, they're registered with NZTA and they don't pay um, the tax at all. The defined categories of exempt use in the bill are narrow. Uh, they are, for the, to summarise, the bulk supply activities such as electric power stations or gas works or commercial ships or rail. There is some provision for further categories of exemption to be prescribed by regulation for off-road use. The bill also provides for a rebate scheme. So this is where a rebate will apply uh, where someone has paid, but they then seek a rebate because, in fact, it was an exempt use or there is um, another reason that they qualify that's been set out in the regulations, yet to be um, established regulations. Eligibility for rebates is, as I said, is currently limited to fuel that has been used for an exempt use or is otherwise prescribed in regulations. Now, those regulations haven't been created yet. <coughs> The explanatory note to the bill makes it clear that the intention is that there'll be similar exemptions to those under the local authorities' fuel tax provisions in the Local Government Act 1974, and that the bill will allow for rebates consistent with those available for fuel excise duty for off-road use. Um, those relate to use in a commercial ves vessel, in a dedicated search and rescue vessel, or for commercial purposes otherwise than as fuel in a motor vehicle, vessel or aircraft. 
now to deal with the fact that these re regulations haven't yet um, been created, because the legislation isn't yet in force, um, we have sought to make it clear in the submission that it's important to Auckland Council that there is a very clear um, exemption and rebate scheme um, and that uh, the council wants to be involved um, in terms of engaging on what those um, further exemptions and the rebates might be. Um, we understand from Ministry of Transport officials that we're working with that um, there's unlikely to be public consultation on those regulations, but council will be invited to write to the minister to inform the decisions on those regulations. Um, there is an official, uh, the key official from the Ministry of Transport is um, coming to the workshop this afternoon to talk with you. Um, and um, I would suggest that he will be able to provide you with more detail on that potential engagement and, um, and what policy framework they're considering for those regulations. At the moment, what the submission does is signal very clearly that um, we do want to be engaged on that. So the Finance and Expenditure Select Committee has called for written submissions and the deadline for submissions is tomorrow, hence why we are seeking your approval of this submission today. In terms of the content of the submission, um, it's a largely supportive submission, uh, but it does also identify some areas of improvement that we consider would ensure that the bill better achieves its intent. So the submission is, supports the broad policy of the intent to enable regions to be able to um, access this additional source of revenue for funding transport infrastructure. It supports the transitional provisions which enable Auckland Council to take actions in advance of the legislation such as the creation of a proposal in <coughs> consultation. It identifies particular design elements uh, that, um, in, in, in order to indicate our understanding of the meaning of some of them, and then it suggests some improvements in three main areas. Uh, these are set out in, in the paper and in the submission, which you also have. But briefly, in relation to uh, the interest, we propose that um, the, um, that should be managed at a program level rather than in relation to each project. Um, and Michael can talk to that in more detail if, if you'd like to. Um, in relation to variation and termination, um, the, the bill provides a process whereby regional councils can vary their <coughs> scheme. Um, and it also provides a process whereby the ministers can terminate a council's scheme if um, there's certain criteria, but basically if they're um, satisfied after consultation with the council that the council is not appropriately giving effect to the scheme that was mandated. What we're suggesting to try and introduce um, an appropriate level of flexibility there is some amendments so that um, any uh, deviations from the scheme that are not material do not uh, uh, trigger a need to vary or uh, that power to terminate. There are also some very, very technical um, amendments that are in the table at the back of the submission, which I don't propose to go through right now. <coughs> I'll hand over to um, Anna, who's going to take you through, through the local board uh, feedback we received, um, just to preface that. All of the intention is that all of that feedback from the three local boards that have provided feedback will be provided to the select committee with the submission, as is the usual practice. Thanks, Danny. So all local boards have been invited to provide feedback or input into this submission. Uh, as usual, the timeframes were very tight for this, so we've received uh, feedback from just three local boards. Uh, those boards are Great Barrier, Rodney and Franklin. 
the Great Barrier Local Board is looking for the bill to be amended so um, that it can be excluded from the region for which a fuel tax applies and it's also wanting to ensure that fuel for generators um, and for boats are exempt or subject to a rebate. So as Dani was um, saying before, our submission does um, cover the need for exemptions and rebates, but we're yet to see uh, exactly what um, those would be, but we'll have the opportunity hopefully to input into that. The, the Rodney Local Board is uh, thinking along the lines of a regional fuel tax being a blunt instrument, um, not targeting the issue, but having broader impacts on areas um, that might not be congested, i.e. rural, rural areas. So if it's to address congestion, then the mechanism that's used um, needs to be another funding source, not a regional fuel tax. Also looking to ensure that farming, rural operations or marine activities are exempt or subject to a, to, um, a rebate, requiring a council to assess the impact of the tax on road users or others impacted by it, and also um, looking for an assessment of any disproportionate impact of the tax um, to check that it's an appropriate financial tool in the circumstances, um, and also seeking that capital projects must benefit the region if covered by the regional fuel tax. The Franklin Local Board does support a mechanism to fund transport <coughs> infrastructure that would otherwise be, de be delayed or not funded, but again, like uh, Rodney, not convinced that the regional fuel tax is the best mechanism for this, uh, but if a regional fuel tax was introduced, um, they would like it to, to be a temporary one and a short-term measure leading into uh, a congestion charging mechanism in the future. So, as Dani said, our normal process is to append the local board feedback to the Auckland Council submission, and that's what we propose to do here. So, any questions on, on the submission? I was wondering if um, perhaps, Michael, you want to talk through the purpose on the interest side of that, because that's probably slightly more complex, but I think Council's been good to have an understanding of how that potentially plays out. So... The, the key issue there is whether we uh, need to attribute borrowings and interest uh, in the scheme out at an at individual project level um, and say for this X project we're borrowing this much and, and paying it back and, and charging interest over this period while this Y project is funded from directly from the revenue at any one time. We think it's more appropriate to manage this at a scheme level. And we've proposed um, in, in one of the more technical ones that we manage this in the same way we do for uh, targeted rates, for example, through a, a reserve fund. And, and we manage the interest at that fund level rather than try and arbitrarily allocate it out to project by project. All right, thank you, Michael. Anything else, Dani, before we go ahead? No, I, the only thing is I'm just suggesting a slight change to the wording of the recommendations concerning the consultation on the regulations because it was only just a few moments ago that we learnt that there won't be public consultation on the regulations, but it's intention, the intention is that Auckland Council will be invited to write to the Minister with our views on what those regulations should contain. So. Um, I'm just suggesting that the resolutions reflect that change of process. So that's number ID, isn't it? That'll e be fixed e. up as we proceed. Um, so I'd like to put progress here. Someone move the recommendations, then we'll have questions, then we'll have uh, statements. So, Councillor, moved by Councillor Darby. Do I have a seconder? Second. Councillor Hulse, thank you very much. <laughs> questions? Councillor Simpson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, um, I've got four questions. I've got quite a few questions, but I'll stick it to four and just see how it goes and maybe come back to me, Mr. Chair, if you can. Um, um, my questions are in the context of transparency to ratepayers and the residents of Auckland around a bill that um, I believe should be done properly. If it's going to be done, it should be done properly from the word go. So my first question is around um, how do we... How do we reflect in our submission? Well, we haven't reflected it as far as I can see. So how do we reflect in our submission the fact that we need to know what the government's increases in tax are before we put our own in? 
We, and we, we've seen this ourselves. We went out to consultation on 10 cents or 11.5 per cent plus GST. And we've, we've found that the government want to uh, potentially raise, it, raise their tax um, levels themselves. So ultimately, we've been blindsided and, and almost it looks as if that um, we've been a little bit disingenuous which we weren't, but we just didn't know what the government had planned. So there's no reference into our submission asking for the government to be transparent first and foremost about their increases before ours. So um, how can we build that into the legislation, or out of, into our submission? Well, it will, we'll take your direction on that, obviously, but... Um, this legislation is obviously just concerned with the mechanism of the regional fuel tax, and it's, it's, it would not be the um, place to direct the government, if, if, if it was possible to direct the government, um, on um, its decisions in relation to the fuel excise tax. So. Um, yeah, I, you see about where I'm coming from. I've said this to you before, and so I, you know, you knew I was going to ask this question. Um, it's no good saying it's going to be 10 cents if it ends up by being 23 cents. So I think in our submission we need to say that. We need to say, whilst this is a tool that councils can use to add on, we need to have transparency around what you want to do first. So that's, I'll just leave it there. You, that's my, my view. My second... Um, question is again around if we're going to have a mechanism that we can say to Aucklanders we, um, we're asking you to pay more. I think the submission doesn't actually allow us to say what the cost will be, what it's for, what it's on, why and when it's going to be delivered all at the same time. Because sometimes if and I think there's a risk there. You know, you might people. We, we know that Auckland is sort of saying, well, ten cents or maybe, okay. And we haven't had that final feedback, so we don't exactly know. But I mean, the feedback that we got a week before, which is the last lot of feedback I've seen, was pretty well in support. So the question is, how, why can't we add? Why can't the bill ensure that councils are transparent around what the project is, at the same time as the cost? at the same time as why and when it's going to be delivered. Because it doesn't, it just says we want more money, but we don't, it doesn't say what for. So I don't understand why we're not saying that it should all happen concurrently. So council, I'd recommend you have a look through the timeline that was on your desk this morning. That spells out the decision making. Today we're deciding about the submission. Um, Cabinet will be landing its ATAP proposal, we believe next Tuesday. That's why we've scheduled a workshop on ATAP for next Friday. And then we'll be making decisions subsequent to that. It's so we free, can't recess, consult on things that we don't week. know yet. Recess week, I Mr know. Chairman. Point of order. That's irrelevant. Next week is recess week. That's right. That's sacrosanct for councillors to have a break. Not our time frame it's to, to multilate. So that's the process we're going through at the moment, recess week or not. People have so booked Darnie? to go away. Yeah, exactly. Put the government on hold. Here we go. Darnie? So through, my, my through the chair just to answer oh, the question yeah. about the legislation. What, what it does is at, at yeah. 465E, it sets out that very process that requires regional um, councils to put together a proposal to establish the scheme. And that, what that proposal does, it needs to describe a program of capital projects uh, that the uh, regional fuel tax is intended to support, and then um, uh, specify in relation to that program what its objectives are, what the expected effects, positive and negative, of the program are, how it's expected to contribute to achieving the objectives of any relevant regional land transport plan, the relevant GPS, and any other document setting up transport priorities for the region, um, and explain why it's desirable that the regional fuel tax be among the funding sources. So I get that, but it doesn't ask for them all to be done at the same time. And what we've done is we've gone up and asked Aucklanders, will you pay more for this tax? But we haven't told them for what? So, sorry. And then, uh, just to finish, and then for each program, project within that program, the costs and benefits, etc., and there's a whole lot of content. Then the process is that the council goes out and consults uh, its communities on that proposal with all of that detail of what the intended projects are, their costs and benefits, their timelines. And then they take into account that consultation and make a decision on whether to uh, finalise that proposal and submit it to the Minister. So that whole process 
um, is, is, is yet to commence for Auckland Council, and there's a workshop this afternoon to discuss that very draft proposal. Okay, well, my view is that that should all happen at once, not be drip feed, but anyway. My next one is on um, project specific. So you, you talk in the submission around, um, it says we understand that the term project is not intended to be limited to an individual project, for example, Skypath, but it can, it can include groups of related projects, for example, an Auckland-wide road safety project. Um, I, I'm not sure, does that re do you really believe that um, that is clear for Auckland? Because, I mean, if you just had road safety project as one thing that you're saying the tax would be spent on, it doesn't really tell Aucklanders exactly what that would be. Some would argue that that should just be um, projects that the, they're all, their ratepayer funded should cover anyway. This is an extra. This is something over and top, over the, over um, and above what, what the rates uh, funding sort of is paying for. So I think, I don't agree with that statement and I wonder, do you think it's clear enough my question is, do you think it's clear enough for Aucklanders as a special extra project? So... Well, what was the reasoning between taking, being, be, taking that word projects and trying to make it vaguer and not more specific? So, with the, um, the way in which we've been working with the Ministry on how, how a proposal may be formed up, we've, we're trying to find a, a balance between specificity of what, what we will deliver for, um, for Aucklanders for the tax and also, but being able to put a, um, produce a, a proposal that, that people can understand and they can put their finger on, on what the money will go to. So we need to, so what we're looking to do is we will still be required in the proposal to clearly outline what each project is, what will be delivered, costs and benefits, timelines, but we think that that there's probably an optimum level of specificity that allows it for something that, that Aucklanders can digest um, when they're being consulted on it, but, all, but equally gives them, both them and the Minister confidence that, that Auckland knows what they're doing and, and what they want to spend the money on. Okay. And my final question, Mr Chair, is just around the introduction. Um, and I'm not sure it's 100% correct. It says that Auckland Council supports the amendments proposed in the bill, which will enable regional councils to fund infrastructure programs that would otherwise be delayed or not funded. Um, I don't know that this is about projects that would be otherwise delayed or not funded, because there are other ways of funding transport projects. So potentially, um, do you think it would not be more accurate if, it, if that introduction said that Auckland Council supports the amendments proposed in the bill, which would further enable regional councils to fund transport infrastructure programmes stop? Because other ways of funding um, transport projects would be third party capital, PPPs, tolling, or, you know, there are, there are other ways of funding transport projects. Right. So to, to lead Aucklanders astray by saying they'd be late, delayed or not funded isn't, I, isn't surely completely accurate. Do you need to have those words? Yes, through the Chair. Um, yes, there is, I agree there is some complexity there. Um, that, that wording actually reflects the uh, requirement in the legislation that um, the um, program of projects um, that the Council must be satisfied that that program would A, benefit the region and um, that one or more of the capital projects cannot reasonably be fully funded from sources other than a regional fuel tax within the time frame desired by the council. Within the time frame. Desired so that's, by the council. Uh, that's, just, that's the interesting one, isn't it? Because you could argue that you'd have to put the case that it couldn't be funded in a different way, but the out clauses within the time frame. Okay, I'll leave my questions there. Thank you. I reserve my right to speak later. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Sayers. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr Chair, and uh, what a dashing figure you're cutting there today. <laughs> Suit your bill. Just your bill. question, <laughs> Mr Sayers. Um, well, they are questions. Three, um, just a couple. Um, and thank you, Danny, for your presentation. Um, it was most helpful. Um, so I, I think I probably can nail this down to three questions. The first, because this is, these are not, what I understand, that we've got the opportunity here, those exemption regulations are fixed yet. So let's take this opportunity to try and um, you know, get what we want. So, so my first question is around um, the 
exemptions and how they relate, then they relate back, well, well, the rebates, really, and how they relate back to the exemptions. And uh, just as specifics in that, um, I was just, well, is, is Council's intention to listen to the, some of that feedback we've got and then try and get rebates for specifics such as tractors, fans, generators, recreational boats, um, m mowers that are used on farms, those type of things that, that are either, you know, I guess, m private marine or farm related um, activity. So is that, uh, is that what we're going to do? And try and nail it down to very specific categories or things? So yes, our, our intention is to, to follow your lead. Uh, we, what we would do would be to, um, so the council will be invited to submit a letter to the minister to inform the development of the regulations, and we'll do that um, guided by yourselves. And and our direction so far has been that it would be in in the direction that you've spoken. Right. Do you want me to? Re I'll reinforce that if you like in the debate, but I, you know, I think it, it is important to include. Um, uh, second question, just that the rebate, the rebate mechanisms, in other words, when, when somebody does apply for the rebates, do we understand yet what that process is? And the reason why I ask that question, just to put into context, is the effort and perhaps paperwork that somebody has to go to to, to rebate back all the things that they're entitled to rebate to, is it versus perhaps, you know, um, some... Some vehicles already have their diesel, um, what's the correct word for it? The diesel exemptions, excise things, and we already know who they are. So do those vehicles also have to be, the fuel going to those vehicles have to be part of that rebate system? So my question is just how advanced, Mr Chair, are we in that process? Do we understand how that might work, or is that yet to distill out? So I'll let Michael answer the detail around it, but Councillor, I understand is the, under the current excise scheme for petrol, petrol you can claim a rebate for non um, road use. In, in many cases that's rural things, it's like chainsaws or petrol driven tractors and so forth. And people do that, the process is not, not onerous, I understand, at the current time for what I've seen because I've actually done it. Yeah. Um, it matter whether that type of scheme will get rolled into this process, which is really just a computerised sheet program on bulk deliveries, but I'll let Michael fill in a bit more detail. But this is work we're yet to do with the Crown, quite frankly. Right. Thank you. So yes, the, as the Deputy Mayor has pointed out, there, there is a scheme already in place and the, the uh, New Zealand Transport Agency, who will be administering the rebate scheme, have advised us they're, they're already working on how their current processes will be adapted to enable this. And they, they have advised us so far that that should be reasonably straightforward. Okay, and Michael, I'm correct in thinking, I think you've touched on this, that the public don't get to have a say in that that's something that's been worked on um, directly between officers. On the process? Yes, yeah. uh, that's That's... The NZTA's process; they they will. The legislation gives them the the responsibility for administering the rebate scheme. Okay. I, just, I mean, just to clarify, the, the legislation does set out the, the framework for that rebate um, scheme. If you if you okay. you can um, read it, if you have time, 65 clause 65W onwards. But as Michael says, the sort of the mechanics and practicalities of how that is going to work. Is a conversation between with NZTA. Okay, Danny, thank, thank you for that. I will we'll have a read of that. And my final question, um, Mr. Chair, is the uh, the intentions around the feedback we received around Great Barrier and Rodney. You've mentioned that want to be excluded from the scheme. What's Council's intentions in that area? Is that something that you want to get direction from today? Uh, through the chair, yes, we. Uh, uh, welcome your direction on that. Um, at the moment, the, um, I mean, the legislation is predicated on the basis that it is a regional fuel tax. Mm. There is nothing currently in the legislation uh, that provides for um, or anticipates parts of a region being excluded. <coughs> the submissions from um, Great Barrier um, um, will be the submissions will be appended to the submission from Auckland Council, so that will be available to the select committee to consider. 
but if you would like to incorporate <coughs> any of that or make any amendments to the submission today to reflect that local board feedback, um, we're happy to take your direction on that. Oh, thank you, Dan. So, so today, it's today that we have to do that. If we're going to do it, it should be done. Or we can do it signal today. Yeah, that's what you're saying. Uh, yep. Yes, sir. Yep. Okay. And just to clarify, Rodney's not asking to be excluded, but um, is talking about congestion, ca congestion charging being a better mechanism for addressing congestion, but Great Barrier is asking to be excluded. Thank you, thank you for that clarification. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. So, Danny, Michael, just to actually clarify that point, do we have to look at the exemptions policy or rebate policy today as part of the submission other than the broad stroke, or would that better off be placed when we actually make the application for a regional fuel tax to Auckland? I think it's open to you to signal it. Certainly, um, it's something that should be considered in the context of the proposal for Auckland, yes. Yeah. Um, however, it is open to you, if you wanted to, to signal that in your submission to the legislation as well. Thanks, Tony. I'll take guidance from the Chamber, but my personal view would be that the appropriate time would be when we actually do apply to have a regional fuel tax, rather than at this point in time we're actually submitting just on the bill itself. Uh, Councillor Darby. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, um, in the perfect world, yes, everything is synced. Everything lands on the same date, and that's we don't have a perfect world of governance. Um, otherwise, we just have one decision on GPS and, and this and everything else, and we know that that cannot be um, for a range of good reasons. But what I am interested in, in, in making sure... Uh, is reflected here in the regional fuel tax uh, bill is that it does um, enable delivery in Auckland of what's contained in the government policy statement, which came out after the bill was drafted. So have you looked through the, government, uh, the GPS, the government policy statement on transport, and looked at what the government expects to be delivered, even though it's a draft GPS, and have you looked through that lens and to ensure that the amendment bill delivers upon that expectation? And Chair, I probably want to have some confidence that it is to fund the transport infrastructure projects and programs. I think the intro to the bill talks about fund transport infrastructure programs. It's, it's projects and programs. And it is not just new projects in program, or n just new projects with consequential OPEX, that it is allowing for the delivery of, say, optimization of the network and technology and a whole lot of other things that are highlighted in the GPS. Through the chair. Um, there's a few questions there and I'll, I'll, I'll start off and then hand over to Michael. Um, just in terms of alignment with the GPS, um, what the legislation requires is that a regional council's proposal must align with the GPS. So um, it requires that when a regional council is establishing a proposal um, it, it, um, for a program of capital projects, it must explain in that proposal how it is expected to contribute to achieving the objectives of any regional land transport plan and the relevant GPS. So, um, and I'll hand over to Michael in a minute, who's been closer to developing the proposal that's going to be brought to you. But yes, that proposal has been prepared uh, with re close regard to um, the GPS. Um, so that's the first point. Um, the second point I'll answer is a question of program and projects. Uh, clause 65E of the bill, it describes again how that, that scheme works and it the, the language it uses is that the proposal is for a program of capital projects. So the program is the broad 10-year program and within that there will be a number of projects and that is the language that the legislation uses and that we have followed in our draft proposal. Okay, just examining that a little bit, Mr Chair, I think I, I want to have some confidence that it will cover things like 
um, optimizing the utilization of your existing capital projects, getting more out of that in addition to the new capital projects, because that's what the GPS says in no uncertain terms. <coughs> are, you, are you confident that the way the bill is drafted at the moment will allow for um, optimization? Um, so, so the say road, road safety was referred to. So road safety, scathing numbers, 78% increase in deaths and 73% increase in serious injuries in just three or four years. So that often comes about, you address that through new CapEx, but you often address it through just better OPEX spend. Yes, so the, there's two, two pieces there. One, the first is that the key, key focus of the, of the bill and therefore of, of any proposal is that it's projects that would not otherwise be funded, basically. So um, it does focus on capital projects, but they do not necessarily need to be brand new capital projects. Um, we've looked at them, there's probably three different categories. Some may be capital projects that we've often talked about but actually could not fund. Second, maybe um, the expansion of existing programs, um, be they safety programs or um, uh, PT prioritization projects, um, or the uh, programs, or thirdly, brand new capital projects. So the, the bill does not limit us just to new um, capital projects that have, have not been spoken of. It's about enabling us to do more than, than we could do with our existing funding sources. So that, that could be an expansion of an existing program such as a safety program. Chair, I probably would feel a lot more confident if we, in, the, in our submission, we made it clear that there is an expectation that we can use the RFT um, revenue, the funds, to undertake things like bus priority lanes in existing, within existing um, capital projects, route optimization, the application of technology, um, even maintenance. Maintenance and general OPEX are real challenges. Um, it, it just concerns me that the way it's written at the moment risks <coughs> it only being applied to brand new capital and brand new programs and the consequential OPEX. Thank you, Councillor Darby. From our working with the Auckland Transport Alignment Project and, and these sort of funding mechanisms in the past, the additional fundings would be to advance our programs that are already listed and new ones besides things that will improve the network efficiency, whether it's um, active modes, mass transit or traditional vehicles. And I read that the, the submission encompasses all that, but if we want some more specificity at your request, um, I don't see any reason why we should not be able to put that and incorporate that in, because I think it's a viable point. You're supporting what I said, actually. <coughs> mm. that, so, would that so be all right, Chris and Michael, may that be done? The key point there would be that the legislation does specifically call out capital projects. Our interpretation and following discussions with the Ministry has been that that could include um, capital projects such as uh, bus priority measures um, on the existing network, um, but to move into things such as maintenance would, would require us to, sub to include that in our submission. Might need a bit more input from the Chief Executive and Auckland Transport on this. I think we need to understand that area, I think it's critical. Change the introduction as I suggested it. Thank you, Councillor Darby. Councillor Hills. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so, obviously, this is to fill a gap of funding we kn knew we used to have. We do you know where the funding gap is now, or what the last announced ATAP funding gap was that we needed to try fill? No, there's no. The, um, there's been no announcement of the latest ATAP work yet. Um, we're expecting that next week. Okay. And the, what would we, if we 
was they submitted against this piece of legislation, what amount of funding would we be foregoing over the next 10 years? What are we looking to raise from this as a council? Our current projections and in our consultation document, we stated uh, approximately $130 million a year. Um, we late, latest forecast, we've been working on with the ministry on that, that it may be closer to $150 million a year. Okay, and would that also add, with that $150 million a year, would that add the NZTA subsidy as well? Would we get even more increase? It would, it would enable us to do projects that would qualify for NZTA subsidies. And if we were to raise that money through rates, how much would that be on the rates? Be approximately a 10 to 11 percent rates increase. Okay. And did the last government consult with us on the 17 cents they put up petrol excise for? I don't know, sorry. I don't. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hills. Councillor Bartley. Yes. Thank you, Mr Chair, and through you, uh, thank you for your presentation. I have two questions. Um, so the bill gives the power to NZTA to charge us um, ongoing administering or on, for ongoing costs of administering the regional fuel tax. Do you have any idea what that could be, and should we put some kind of parameters about that around that so that we don't end up paying a lot? Um, and I also wanted to ask about um, four on Schedule 1 AA where we have to pay a million dollars. So I'm just trying to make sure we don't pay too much of what we're getting, basically. So, so on the first question, we are currently working with NCTA um, to try and get what their initial estimates are of the, the administration costs, but we don't have those as yet. Okay. And my, so the million dollars as well? We can't say, no, we're not paying that. No, OK, never mind. Long shot. My other question is definitely a long shot. Um, so I'm looking at Clause 65C um, and looking at the definition of excise being a tax levied on certain goods and commodities. Um, That's its name. <laughs> yeah. Could, could there be any way we could interpret that excise to be a regional fuel tax if it's paid regionally? Say yes. Sorry, through the chair, I'm sorry. Um, clause 65C, one, one, where it says no more than one regional fuel tax oh, scheme right. may be in force in, at any time in a regional mm. fuel tax region. Uh, well, the, um, the fuel excise tax is... Um, administered under a different piece of legislation and correct me if I'm wrong, it goes into the National Land Transport Fund, Fund and is then allocated mm. um, across the region. regions. So, no, it wouldn't, it, it would not be deemed a regional fuel tax scheme. It couldn't be interpreted as that. <laughs> I think that a, a regional fuel tax scheme under this legislation is a regional fuel tax that has been um, empowered by this legislation and made through an order in council under this legislation. So I don't think there would be any prospect of that So the excise tax would go through a different process, which would mean it wouldn't be defined as, as a regional fuel tax. Yes, that's correct. Mm. Okay, I tried. Yeah, good try. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Hulls. Yes, good on Councillor Bartley. This has been a thorn in our side forever. And I think we've asked every government possible for, could Auckland please just get the money that they pay back in fuel tax back to Auckland, despite what the rest of New Zealand says that, you know, they're subsidising us. I think our Auckland money is actually paving some very nice roads in the South Island, but I'll get shot for saying that. So I've got a couple of questions, Mr Chair. First of all, am I correct in, in kind of understanding that what we're, the point of tension here is specificity? Um, and what we're saying is we're actually going for transparency and outcomes rather than tying ourselves down to a 10-year plan that may well change and need to be organic as we go. That, I think that, that for me is the nub of this. And if I look at our submission, page 5, our um, agenda, page 13, we talk about what we're asking for is the ability to deliver um, cleaning maintenance, energy costs, and those kind of things within what might be classified as some of the 
projects here. Um, so I just, I just want to be really clear about that because I think we could put this entire issue at risk if we start to come up with a shopping list. And if you look at today's Herald with Pippa Coombe talking about road safety, I don't know what that's going to look like in five years' time, and I don't want to pre-write that list. I want to actually work with our community and Aucklanders on what that list looks like on an ongoing basis. We can promise outcomes. So just as long as I'm clear on that. Um, secondly, I had a question about the rebate scheme. You answered that beautifully. We're kind of doing that already. And my third question is, am I correct in, in my concern, which is that we're conflating two issues? We have the government that goes out every year or every couple of years or whenever they do and talks about the excise increase. And currently I think the proposal is for three cents. They do that. That's their job. That's kind of their thing. Ours is, and our submission is about, can we do a regional fuel tax that we can spend in Auckland on stuff that is really important to Aucklanders? And the two, albeit that they will be linked eventually, are entirely separate now. Is that correct? Exactly correct. And the final point is... I understand people's frustration about the fact that the list of things we want to do with this can only be settled in a parallel fashion to this. I think, Mr Deputy Mayor, it would be really useful for us to work on the list of outcomes and the list of things that we will and could do with this with some clarity, and that's why that workshop is so critical on Friday. So is that the kind of thing we'll be discussing at the workshop? So this afternoon we're going to have a high level discussion on some of those pieces. Mm -hmm. we, we are at the mercy of the government until their cabinet actually signs off yep. on the Auckland Transport Alignment Project 2.0. Once that's happened then we can do it and we believe that they will be doing that next Tuesday. We won't know till after Tuesday and that's why we've scheduled that workshop. For those councillors who have um, bookings they've done for their recess week, uh, humble apologies, we will be sending to you electronically the um, those, those workshop notes, diagrams, graphs, and lists. Um, we're trying to do the best we can here in a time frame that we actually do not control. Thank you, Councillor Hulls. Councillor Watson. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mr Chair. Um, just a couple of questions in the context of uh, perhaps what uh, a member of the public might ask in reading our submission. Uh, and my first one just goes to the the, the comment made in the uh, second bullet point of the context uh, with in the context of um, basically dismissing the independent uh, or the sorry the interim transport levy uh, with the, the follow-up remark that linking uh, transport investment uh, to property owners rather than transport users is not considered to be the fairest option so uh, any regional fuel tax proposal, and certainly the one that, that we have engaged on, uh, is, is it, it's based on the premise of, of, not, of no charge being used to public transport users. Am I correct? Or is that yet to be decided in terms of whether buses and ferries pick up a consequential cost of, uh, you know, of the fuel they use? Have we, have we determined that yet or, or not? So it's just really question the accuracy of, of, of transport users. I'll take your point. On, on the question, um, we think that um, ferries are um, excluded, um, but buses are not currently exempted. Right. So that would be a potential matter for um, the regulations. I, I, okay, so, so I, all right, so conceivably, uh, the public transport users that use buses, <coughs> they, they could be some of the people that are contributing to the regional fuel tax, couldn't they, if, there's an, if the cost is passed on? Pre presently, yeah. yes. O okay, thanks. Um, just uh, in terms of uh, uh, 60, uh, actually, just before that, the duration, we, we make a, a reference to the duration of uh, RFT uh, maybe up to 10 years. Of, of a regional fuel tax. Have, have we specified any time duration in our, in our consultation? I, I can't recall. Maybe we did. Have we said anything about that, 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 that 10 years or a lesser version, or have we left it open? Uh, can, can anyone provide a bit of clarity on that? Well, we're yet to consult on our um, proposed Auckland regional fuel tax, yeah. but 
um, uh, the draft proposal is for a 10-year scheme. Okay, thanks. Final question, um, just to do with uh, 65E then, we did have a, a comment made um, a little while ago about you know, the proceeds going into to, to the one pool and essentially you know, more projects being en enabled by that. I, I seem to recall words to that effect uh, reasonably recently. I'm assuming, therefore, that our submission where we are, uh, we are saying that, yes, we might want to, to generalise smaller projects into, into one heading, but we are going to have to be far more specific in the other projects which are enabled by this as a consequence of this legislation. So the, you know, chuck it in the pool and it's 103 to 120 that get done now that wouldn't be done before. That's out then, isn't it, under, this, under the, what we're saying in the submission? So the legislation will require us to be specific in our proposal okay. as to exactly what projects get delivered. Okay, and, and I guess following Councillor Simpson's point to do with giving the public some sense of what would be getting funded normally, as opposed to this, will be up to us to make very, very clear then, uh, obviously, during the, the consultation process. Two weeks. Yeah, okay, thank you. It, this, that's very much council on that sort of first May to the 14th consultation process on Two weeks. RLTP. We've got Councillor Newman, please. Good morning. Um, a couple of um, questions on the on the bill from me. Clause 65C um, four states that the regional fuel tax quantum is exclusive of GST, mm -hmm. and that there is a consequential adjustment to the Goods and Services Act um, legislation to change the definition uh, to include regional fuel tax what is the what is the good or the service that attracts a GST <laughs> uh, through the chair so um, as you've said the bill amends the GST Act um, that to provide for the purposes of that act um, the term supply means any regional fuel tax that is, that is paid is treated as being consideration for a supply of services um, for the purposes of being a taxable activity um, carried on by NZTA. So that, that consequential amendment um, provides that GST will be payable. The figures quoted earlier, the 130 to 150 million uh, per annum, is that exclusive or inclusive? Of GST. Exclusive. Okay, so at 130, there's 19 million of GST attracted to that. At 150, there's 22.5 million attracted for GST purpose. Okay. Um, if the service um, carrying on from the service that attracts a GST, um, can I understand that at clause 65N sets out that the function of the New Zealand Transport Agency is for collection? administration and distribution and then at clause 65 ZF there's no limitation on claims really? by the agency to recover um, from the regional fuel tax so actually there is no cap here around the administration cost is there what could that what could that look like I mean councillor Bartley raised the issue in the schedule, there's a million dollar hit immediately. Mm -hmm. That's quite a quantum of money, and there's no cap on the um, clause 65ZF. <coughs> it seems like a very expensive exercise. You're correct, there is no cap provided for in the legislation. This is what the, the government has proposed in this legislation. Okay, um, I'm now going to, so the, um, at clause 65 ZD, um, notwithstanding the fact that at clause 65 C it sets a 10 cents per litre maximum regional fuel tax, at 65 ZD, 
uh, states that the Governor General by uh, from time to time by order and council amend 65 C3 to change the maximum amount of regional fuel tax under the RFT scheme. So theoretically, if a regional council wished to go out with a proposal for a high maximum amount, um, all we've got here is a mechanism by order and council to change that maximum amount. Over time, does that theoretically provide for a higher quantum? Um, well, yes. I mean, as the, obviously as the legislation currently stands, the maximum that a council could propose is 10 cents. Yep. But there is the ability for the Governor General by order and council to change that maximum rate. So that could take place. Just to clarify, change the maximum amount above that about above that figure? Yes. So regional but that, would, but that wouldn't sorry, that wouldn't automatic that wouldn't apply automatically flow through to an existing scheme. So if a regional council has a scheme in place. Yep. And that's been given effect to by order and council. Yep. Um, Th that, that would stand. This, this provision here in 65 ZD1 would change the legislative setting across the board, the maximum yep. across the board. So uh, regional, fuel, would mm. a regional fuel tax would expire, a regional council would come up with a new regional fuel tax proposal, potentially setting an amount greater than the maximum set down, and if that went through a proposal and it was agreed, and the ministers agreed just by ordering council you would seek to very uh, to um, to change the maximum amount beyond that. Um, so just to be clear, I think that the, the maximum in the legislation would have needed to have been first changed by the Governor General before a um, regional council was to submit for a greater amount. Okay, but the, the provision of this Act sets the process for how the Governor-General by order and council could actually lift the, lift the ceiling on what the regional fuel tax could be. Yes. Okay, that's a pretty wide power. I reserve my right to comment. Yep, certainly. Councillor Mike Lee. Yes, um, I, I, I um, have a question and a couple of requests of if that's appropriate now. Um, just to confirm that in regard to the question, um, it, 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 can you confirm that this will, legislation will not be enacted until 2021? Is that the plan? Uh, through the Chair, no. The, um, the timeline is um, the legislation will be enacted um, in, in June. I, I, I beg your pardon. The provisions, the fuel tax provisions... Will they not come into force until 2021? The, the, the legislation will come and is expected to be in force by 1st of July, yes. latest. Um, the, by, um, it only applies to or, or enables Auckland Council to seek a regional oh, fuel in tax yeah. until the, 2021. And the rest of the country is 2021. Yes. Okay. That's interesting. Um, may I suggest in regard to the mihi mihi, that um, it's okay what we tell ourselves how great we are and how great Auckland is. It's a view not necessarily shared by other parts of New Zealand. So Auckland, beloved of hundreds, famed among the multitude, <laughs> envy of the thousands, you are unique in the world, may not go down that well in the region. So I'll just leave you, leave you with that thought. Um, can, 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 my, my request is this. I, I um, was in this room was it four or five years ago when the original Land Transport Management Act 2008 was repealed at the behest of, of Minister of a lot of things, the Honourable Stephen Joyce. And uh, this council, um, to my surprise, went along with it. Um, now, the reason I didn't, but the reason why I remind members of this is that these um, provisions uh, can be very fragile 
and hard to sustain um, and cannot be taken for granted. Uh, the 2008 provisions um, were put through by the previous Labour-led government, but later in that year, um, a national-led government came into power and never uh, enacted them. And in fact, in 2012 or 13, um, they repealed them. And all the fuel tax money was diverted in, in, into road building. So just be aware that these things can be ephemeral. And therefore, it's very, very important that we get the people of Auckland at least on our side. And the best way to do that in imposing an extra tax um, is to ensure that what they are getting is very, very clear and defined. Now, if we're going to include uh, OPEX, um, we're making things very vague and open-ended and could give the impression that this is just another fund um, on top of the rates rather than something that is very, very special and, and something that is dedicated uh, to achieving something significant, extra, and as I say, something very special. We're, we're not doing that, and I think um, that's going to be a, a problem in getting uh, a public support. Uh, key parts of, of the provisions are put back after the next general election, and we have to recognise in terms of the fragility of, of these measures that the governing party is not the most popular party in the country. That's an unusual situation. So things are even more fragile than they normally are in this particular area. So I suggest that we restrain ourselves, if you like, and say, look, this should be just for CAPEX. And to bear in mind, when it comes to CAPEX and OPEX, in our um, long-term plan, I think there's about 40, 40 billion over the next 10 years in OPEX. Sorry? Just wait. Carry on, Councillor. Uh, and 25 billion in CAPEX. So there's a huge disparity. So my uh, request is that you, we uh, trim our sails, if you will, and um, apart from it being hypothecated, we make it cap capex, capital expenditure only, so that the people of Auckland can see where this money is going. Now, the other request, and I think Councillor Casey has tabled an amendment, that, that we, we think about Great Barrier Island. So, Councillor, with your permission, I'll finish the, the questions on this item, then we'll put up the amendment, then you can speak to it, and you and Thank Councillor you. Casey have moved and seconds. Thank Is that you. all right? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Casey. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, Mr Chairman. I've got three questions. My first is about um, Clause 65A, the exemptions. My second is about 65L, the ministerial stomping clause. And the third is what's happening next week. So on exemptions, you've just heard there is there will be a um, an amendment to support the Great Barrier Local Board in terms of exempting the island from the provisions of the scheme. Um, and I'll talk about that when we get to the amendment. The second one then is the ministerial stomping clause, which I've just really seen. It. I, I just wonder why we would be supporting that. It seems to me that it's giving the Minister of Finance and Transport, both ministers, a chance to tell local gov government what to do. Yep. And there's plenty of provisions in other acts of local government goes off goes off the off the rails so i'm i'm not happy with us supporting that i i, I don't think we even came up in the workshop actually it didn't and so i've just looked at it now I, I i don't think i would be agreeing to that so why would we yeah. why why have we agreed to that well through the chair um we'll take your direction on that um i think that clause enables the ministers to uh, terminate the scheme if the regional council is actually not giving effect to the scheme in the form that it's proposed and has been improved. Um, noting, of course, that this is a tax set by central government and that is a power that they have uh, proposed it, that they retain. Um, our submission on um, that 
is actually largely designed to try and um, achieve some flexibility. So if there are anything less than really material deviations from the scheme, um, the ministers are not able to exercise that power. Yeah, no, I, that's great, Danny. But why don't why don't we say Auckland Council has concerns with regard to the ability of the? Because that's what you're saying, you know. We, we, but we actually see we agree with the expressibility of the minister to stomp on local government, and that, that doesn't sit right. So I would probably seek your guidance, chair, to say that we we have concerns about that the way it's drafted at the current. I the current think, time. council, what it's saying is the actually. The Crown has to agree to a regional fuel tax, whether it's Auckland or elsewhere, and this clause really gives them the ability to remove that approval should things not go as stipulated in the application. I think that's all it means. And, and I'm saying I'm that um, we have concerns about that as expressed in the narrative, so we shouldn't be agreeing to it. We should just be saying we acknowledge it and um, our concerns would be met if you do this. So it's about the agreement, the stomping clause, don't, don't agree? Uh, if that's the direction, we, we could change that. So it's just noting that that, um, that would power be, is there and suggesting our improvement. I, I believe the government will always want to retain a degree of control over this, but I'm you, sure you take, you do. <laughs> yeah, I am take sure your point, you point, Councillor. Right, and my third area of concern. Um, yeah, I'm looking at this timeline which you tabled today and, and we've heard it seems to me that this thing that's happening next week, which is in our recess week and the parliamentary recess week, is actually a briefing. It's not a. It's it's a. That's why you can send it to us. So, so it, look, the day before there's an announcement on ATAP by government and council. The day before this workshop thingy. Mm. So can you can you just tell me what's going on? It, are you asking us to come from the Ertz and Peart to this room? to input into something or to receive information? Because if it's receiving information, just send it to us. So it is the receiving information, councillor, but it is a fairly important piece of information. Um, you remember the ATAP last time. And also it is to help preload for the decision making um, on the governing body meeting on Monday the 30th. However, I fully understand that you know this has happened at relatively short notice. Um, it has been processed a little bit out of our complete control. We're working with the Crown here because it's an Auckland Council government um, agreement. Um, they have Their cabinet has to approve it, as I said before, which is this coming Tuesday. Um, and then there will be a, an opportunity for us to have that briefing on the Friday and a very full discussion the following Monday in decision. So just an opportunity for a heads up, if you like, um, for those who can attend. And I think so far we've got almost half the councils able to attend. Which isn't great for an employee. No, it's not great, but it's, it's better than... Uh, um, my final question relates to the red D up there. I just, I'm looking for a definition of Auckland Council. In this submission, Auckland Council actually means the governing body with the local boards tacked on. What does Auckland Council mean in relation to D? Is that Auckland Council and the local boards, or is it just Auckland Council governing body? We are one family, Auckland Council and, and local boards together, so it would be us as a family. I would presume, Danny? Uh, well, it just means Auckland Council. Um, the precise timelines for that, um, relating to that invitation, are yet to be, we're yet to be informed of that, so obviously we'll do our best to um, involve and get feedback from um, local boards. And the trouble the is that their, their, their time frame for business meetings is different to ours, so it's, it would take longer time to get that. And we may not have that time on the ground. Can we actually write in, including local boards up there? Just so it's it's not been our standard practice to date, so. responding to Crown um, submission times. Well, I haven't seen the local board um, feedback. It's being tacked onto our submission. So, you know, if we're Auckland Council, do we not have the right to see it? Uh, it has emailed been, last night. I, I understand got, that yeah. was emailed to you last yeah. night. It only came in last night. And it's on the hub. I don't have the hub, sorry. But if somebody could print it out for me, I'd be very delighted to read it. Thank you. It'd be available on your phone, Council. I don't have the hub. Whatever no, the hub is. It's emailed. Emails last so it'll be on your phone. I don't read on my phone. I listen to the meeting. <laughs> Councillor Bartley. Thank you, Mr Chair, and through you. Um, I just have two questions. Um, if, if the Governor-General... Um, on the recommendation of the Minister of Finance or the responsible minister varies a regional fuel tax scheme, do they have to go through a community consultation process? Yeah. 
certainly um, if the variation is um, instigated by the council, yeah. we would okay. need to consult again. But not through the minister. And my other question is, uh, following on from Councillor Simpson, um, since we're doing a submission on this bill, are we doing a submission on the draft government policy statement? And perhaps it's a question for you, Mr Chair. We have done one that was approved from the last meeting to, for it to be drafted. Danny, up from, am I doing that, saying that correctly from memory? Pass, please. Um, because Sorry, those I haven't been that close that to that. that. Um, we can find that out for you very quickly and come back to you. Yeah, we, are. we have. Oh, okay. You we have. are, we have. Because yeah. the, the concerns that Councillor Simpson raised could be addressed through that process. But it sounds like it's too late. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Cooper. Oh, I think my, a lot of my questions have been asked, but I, I also just wondered, we're having a workshop on this after, so a lot of the questions being asked will be addressed then in terms of all of the questions that have been asked? So this is just about the submission this questions, is the submission. not... Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, so just to clarify, there will be a process around um, the exemptions being consulted on later on outside of this. Is that right? We've been advised... Which is in the report. ..by the um, Ministry of Transport officials that we will be invited to write to the Minister um, with our thoughts on that. Um, it's not our understanding that there will be a, a public consultation process. Okay, so in terms of the um, amendment or addition, um, that will help form part of that letter that councillors are putting up? So I think that's one of the questions I asked around, especially Great Barrier's submission, and we talked about it last week too, is the fact that when people don't have a choice, so, yeah, I think, and so in terms of that, would then those local board, all of those local board um, submissions all actually talk about um, having no choice but to use petrol, basically. So will that help form part of the exemption letter, all of those submissions as well? I think that's where it would be even more useful. Absolutely. Okay, good. Thank so you. I think, Councillor, you, you make a valid point that we are now discussing the submission when we actually make our application, we can include a raft of things, including exemptions or exceptions and rebates in that submission to the Crown for a fuel tax. This is just the submission on the, on the Act that's been yeah, put up so by Parliament. Mr Chairman, I'm really keen for those submissions from those local boards and even um, any rural part, which also is coastal, west coast of Auckland as well, to actually really make the case for exemptions um, in terms of travel that has no public transport, and even the public transport, you know, we've also got to look at the buses too, because that makes up the largest part of our public tra uh, transport trips is actually buses, and they're not all electric, they're very, very few. So I think that's really critical in terms of exemptions as well. If we're, if we're exempting um, ferries, which is public transport, and electric trains aren't included, that a huge part of our public transport network is fueled by. So that would be handled at the application point. Yep, good. Councillor, Thank I imagine. You. Yep. So we have completed our questions. What I propose now, with your permission, is to actually put the amendment up. We'll debate the amendment, vote it in or out, and then go to the substantive. Can, can I just I've ask a question? One more question, sorry, Mr Chair. So uh, we've given some questions around the submission. How do we know whether those questions or those points are going to be changed? Do we have to do, are you on amendment on every, on every issue? Or? I think the staff have noted the, your, the key points and they will have a list of those for us before we include the debate. Before we, okay. Okay. So, Councillor Darby. Thank you, Chair. You've said you've concluded questions, but I think it's fair to um, make available the opportunity to ask questions oh. of staff on the amendment because I need to understand the implications for network planning, um, particularly ferry connections and all that sort of thing. Yeah. So is, the is there somebody from Auckland Transport here that can explain what that might, um, what the implications? impacts um, yeah. might be for that? I don't believe there is anyone, Councillor. And one of the 
points I would make that this particular amendment that's been put by councillors Lee and Casey could in fact be part of our application should we decide to choose so and it doesn't have to be taken as part of the, uh, submission. Of the um, yeah. our submission points today. In fact, it's probably better at the application point rather than the submission point, but I'll be in the hands of councillors Lee and Casey over that particular point. Councillor Mike Lee. Th thank you. Thank you, um, Mr Acting Mayor. C can I um, um, make a case for um, excluding Great Barrier at the outset, or at least signalling to Parliament its very special situation? Um, this is special pleading. And, and uh, I guess uh, as somebody who's involved in special pleading has to convince um, his peers that the situation is validly special. Uh, is this a special situation? And it is. The Great Barrier is nearly 100 kilometres away from here. Um, it's about the same size as the Auckland Isthmus, 280 square kilometres. Um, they have, unlike its rural, but unlike rural areas of the mainland, they have no linear connection with the rest of New Zealand. They have no state highways running through them as our mainland rural areas do. Um, they have no connectivity and they have no power. They are not on the grid. Now, there's not many uh, places in New Zealand that can say that, um, and so we, I think, it behoves us to be fair to our communities, diverse communities, that in this case we have a, a very special case in Great Barrier Island and that the people are totally reliant on fuel uh, for not only for, for travelling around their 113 kilometres of roads, um, but also for the power and heating um, for, for, for their homes. There is no public transport alternative. Um, there is no subsidies for, for transport. Uh, there is no special gold card privileges for the Great Barrier people. They do, by and large, constitute a special circumstance, a special case. And if the Mehi Mehi talks about Auckland being unique, um, Great Barrier is pretty unique in the Auckland context. Auckland, despite the way most of us think, is not just one big conurbation, it's a maritime region. And an island, a big island, um, 100 kilometres away, is a special circumstance when it comes to this legislation. And I think at least we f should foreshadow that to Parliament in our submission at the outset and not wait until we make an application um, w w when we give the impression that all is OK, um, all, all of Auckland is on board. Great barrier is special, and I think this governing body should, should at least recognise that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Wayne Walker. Just want to uh, commend Councillor Lee for his um, amendment. I would suggest that the other point is that it's unlikely that Great Barrier Island is going to actually get anything. Um, my reading of the of the projects and the uh, categories really doesn't leave uh, doesn't leave much for for Great uh, for Great Barrier. So on the principle that why should you pay if you're not going to be getting anything, um, I think the Great Barrier is fairly unique in that respect. Thank you, Councillor. Now, I do stand corrected oh. if somebody wants to say that they are going to get something, but I don't know what it is. We, we don't know that yet, mean, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Casey. Yeah, can I um, invite councillors to go to their hub and look up the feedback from the Great Barrier Island Local Board? I don't need to see it because I, like yourselves, have heard over the years from the Great Barrier Local Board, and even recently on the long-term plan, but myself and Councillor Lee went to Great Barrier. Not only did we hear then from the local board, we heard from the public, and the regional fuel tax was on the top of everybody's list. It's not fair. And this is the first time we are signalling any response to government about the regional fuel tax, and we must, we must lobby 
for our island community at, 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 at the, the top end of our region. We have to do that. And we do it as often as we can and not wait for when it's appropriate or not appropriate. <coughs> Nobody's giving us the rules for the submission, so this is a chance <coughs> for us to say we support you. We think Great Barrier Island should be exempted from this scheme. Simple as that. So I'm hoping for unanimous support because we owe it to them. Councillor Philip Heiner. Um, thank you, Chair. And I, like Councillor Darby, have, have questions, and it's really the timing of those questions that I have. And, and, and that's based on, on your comment around when is the appropriate time to end up um, putting this particular uh, amendment. Because, you know, I mean, with the, the, the previous mechanism we had was the interim transport levy. And, and I'm assuming that the, the, um, that the, the community in Great Barrier Island were, were paying the interim transport levy. So, you know, the questions that, that, that I would have um, is, is as a result of that, what has been done um, on Great Barrier Island? I mean, I, I have sympathy for this, but I don't think it's at the right stage from, from my perspective because, I mean, if, if they uh, are exempt from the regional fuel tax, I know that it's, it's, it's um, putting it in front of the government, but if they are exempt, I mean... Where, where does all the transport issues that they may have around the roads and everything else, where does that sit? Do we end up then stop funding them at all uh, around some of the roading issues? I'm, I'm unsure, and, and I'm still really unsure whether to support this or not based on, on questions that I have and cannot be answered. So, yeah, yeah. yeah you know, I, I, I just take... Chair, your, your point about when is the right time, and, and I don't believe that today is the right time uh, to end up. Let's put the submission through. There's an opportunity all the way uh, through the sheet that's on our desk around the 1st to the 14th of, of May, which is next month, to, to end up having some, some input through there. So that's just my little sixpence. Thanks, Councillor. Councillor Watson. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. Um, yeah, I, I think this is the right time. We, we have uh, had a, uh, a number of submissions from Great Barrier Island in respect of this, so I think it's an appropriate time to signal to them that, that we are listening, and they, they are the most um, startling example of, of, of the need for, for an exemption, and we might as well do it uh, sooner rather than later. On Great Barrier Island, um, uh, current price of... Uh, 91 is three dollars 11 a litre which is of course over a dollar a litre more expensive than than auckland and of course waiheke island is um is also more expensive uh than auckland by by a good 30 cents a litre also um so so i support uh, absolutely the, the the unique circumstances of great barrier island that makes uh, their exemption, you know, just a, a must. There's no way you can really argue against that, in my view. It does, however, uh, signal perhaps a, a, a forthcoming difficulty with the, the regional fuel tax um, because uh, anyone in Auckland will know that the, the price of petrol and goes up and down. I mean, it was only a, a couple of years ago that uh, petrol in Auckland was... Two dollars twenty uh, a litre. I, I certainly knew that. I had a Mitsubishi Diamante at that stage, and um, every five or ten cents increase in the, the petrol price was quite a significant uh, hit, hit to the wallet, especially given the, the amount of running round I was doing. So, uh, what, what uh, and, and this this uh, exemption, what, what it does also perhaps uh, signal it to us is with the movement in price of, of petrol. Uh, the potential for uh, 11 and a half cents or 23, 24 cents if we chuck in the, the government's excise uh, over the next few years start, starts to move conceivably other parts of Auckland uh, into the, certainly into the Waiheke Island uh, uh, scenario and conceivably starting to give Great Barrier a bit of a push for it because if it was at 220 a litre plus 23 cents, which you know conceivably it could go up to, that would mean Aucklanders all around Auckland would be <coughs> would be paying two dollars forty-three a litre, which which is 
starting to push the, the boundaries, I would, uh, I would suggest, for a lot of uh, ordinary, hard-working um, uh, people. So um, I think that's worthy of uh, reflection. I don't know if it's come through in the consultation. I certainly hope it has. But certainly in terms of Great Barrier, at $3.11 a litre, and, and the, the total absence of alternatives, they, they are in a, 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 the, the prime candidate for exemption, and we should make that clear today. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Darby. Uh, Chair, I think this body of work um, needs to be looked at, but we actually need to be informed on this. Right now, that's why I asked, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, this is not the time to examine this tranche of work, but we must examine this work. Yeah. So right now it's premature, and um, mm -hmm. it concerns me that if we pass this, we could actually be not suppressing dust on rural roads, not sealing rural roads, not looking at the 10-year investment uh, infrastructure investment plan that the local board wants. We won't be looking at airfield improvements that they want. That's just we, a, th that's we, just we a won't threat. Please. No, no, <laughs> I'm, there just, was, I said that's just bullying. Bullying of an island Councillor community. Darby, you have the floor. I said there is a risk of us not doing that. Now, I don't want to cut all of that out, including the wharf improvements. Um, the downtown terminal here is likely to be where the passenger service from Barrier comes into in the future. That's a $7,300 million investment. That's shared by all the citizens of Auckland. Um, so there are, they also ask for new cycleways on the island. So let's do that, but not at this stage, and especially when we are not informed by our officials. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Cooper. Thank you. Um, while I do support um, in the work, the letter we send to the minister around exemptions, um, look at you know asking for these things. But I think we need to be informed, because one of the other things I think too is that um, if you don't have electricity, you don't pay an electricity bill, which can anywhere from two to two fifty to four hundred dollars a month. So there's savings on that side, even though petrol is dearer. So there there are swings and roundabouts. So I think there's a little bit more um, work to be done on that. Um, you know, we've got other rural places which pay electricity bills as well as petrol bills. So I think um, we've, we've got to look at it on an apple, you know, apple scrapple, like for like, and um, take into account those confounding factors rather than just, um, you know, jump to this. So, I mean, I'm really happy to be considering that, but I think that's around the work we do for the letter to the Minister on the exemption work. So um, that's why I can't support this at this point. Thank you. Councillor Simpson. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. I think the fact that we're debating this highlights a, a problem with our submission on the bill in the first place because it doesn't put all the dots, doesn't join up all the dots. What are the projects, what are the exemptions and why? So, I mean, theoretically, I, I, it sort of, as a helicopter, I, I, do, um, I do support the exemption of, of Great Barrier because I think there are only a few people that live there and they don't have a lot of the transport options that we have here. But I'm not unconvinced that we still can't help them with their transport priorities based on the rates that they pay that come out of our transport fund that isn't included in the regional fuel tax. So for me, this is just a perfect example of why this thing is sort of trying to be rushed through without the detail. We haven't got the detail in it, which is why we can't decide on whether to support this um, amendment or not. And I, I think that's, you know, just, just a perfect example. But in essence, I believe that if councillors support the exemption of Great Barrier, it doesn't preclude them getting transport funding by the normal channels. Councillor, I wish we could actually supply you with all the de detail of projects that were going to be landed over the next with the RLTP. We just can't do that yet because the RLTP is informed by ATAP. Consequently, that's why you have the sheet of decision making processes in front of you. Again, I state, councillors, today is about approving with some submission. amendments and fine up detail the submission to the Crown mm -hmm. on the Fuel Tax Enablement Act. Okay? That's as simple as that. Councillor Hulse. So just a question on that. I, I absolutely um, support leaving um, barrier out of the added fuel tax. However, 
I am really clear that we are today submitting on the process that would allow us to do that. And I, I guess I'm just a little bit worried that this is well intended and you know from the heart, but it may be premature. So my, my question is, and sorry to repeat, as I think it's already been answered, for those of us that would love to see barrier exempted, but are very keen to not over clutter an already complex process, is do we have sufficient faith in the ability for us when we apply for our regional petrol tax that we can indeed put in very clear exemptions like barrier. Through, Chancellor. Uh, through the Chair, no, at the moment yeah. the legislation assumes that any tax will apply to the whole okay. region. If you would like the legislation to be different mm. in that respect Tell and me. to enable the exclusion of areas, oh, an area. and that would apply to any regional council, yeah. um, I would advise you to signal that in the submission, but it, it wouldn't <laughs> need to be specific to a Great Barrier. It's, it's a change to the yeah. legislation to enable that to happen if the regional council wants to do that. And I think in our enthusiasm we're forgetting this is a piece of national legislation, i.e. New Zealand-wide legislation. I, I would support us very clearly putting in the ability to have well-reasoned exemptions and then when it comes to our application, we advocate quite rightly for barrier to be exempted. I'm just aware in a New Zealand-wide piece of legislation, it sits oddly that we would have a place-specific piece because if I was in the South Island, I would quite rightly argue that maybe islands in the sounds or other areas may well be exempted. So totally support the intent, totally support barrier, but I won't be supporting the amendment in its current state, but hope that we can put in our submission the allowance for well-reasoned exemptions. So I think you've hit a nail on the head there, Councillor. Could I ask the mover and the seconder that we actually just put in our submission that we enable areas to be exempted as part of the legislation? I'm happy to, 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 to cooperate in that way, Mr Chair, and subject to the seconder's assent, but I think it's absolutely essential that we do specify that that Great Barrier is a special situation um, as part of that. We could put Great Barrier in as an EG. Yeah. 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 Would that make sense? Yeah. Are you happy to withdraw yeah. the amendment in low, low of the promise that we'll put that sort of wording in? Yes, please. Yeah. Councillor, yeah. seconder? Thank you very much. So what is the final? Yeah. So that, yeah. like, yeah. to summarise up, Danny, I think the wording is going to be, as part of our submission on the legislation, is that we will look for the ability yeah. to exempt certain specific geographical areas from the fuel tax, e.g. Great Barrier Island. I'm sorry, darling, but we don't have this. So, Hills. so my question would be, how would that be facilitated and are we giving Great Barrier an assumption that that will happen uh, from this? We can apply through our application for the regional fuel tax for Auckland. Would, part of our application would include the item saying, but Great Barrier Island could be excluded or would be excluded. But what would, so we would have to bring that to another report and another meeting? Yeah, there, will be an, there will be another meeting and a report for us to actually apply to this legislation. Always remember, this is just a submission to the legislation, so our, not the our, application. Our proposal um, is coming for consultation on the 30th of April. Yeah. Um, and it, and if, if this went through, then that would be where we would include it in our proposal to the ministers in the draft. Councillor Newman. Yeah, quick question uh, before the mover and second. I don't know if they've, well, it looks like they've withdrawn it, but just to confirm that uh, codifying an exemption in legislation is frankly a higher protection for the exempted community than um, an exemption approved by the minister, isn't it? Two okay. ministers. Two ministers. Yes, that's correct. And just, just to be clear, my advice is that we do, and I think we've decided it will be included in the submission 
on the legislation. So you're asking for the legislation to be changed to accommodate the exclusion of specific geographical areas. How exactly the Select Committee and the Parliamentary uh, Council Office decides to do that um, is for another day, but the submission will now very clearly state that the Council wants the legislation to be designed so specific geographical areas can be excluded. Yeah, because I, I, I mean, I'm not the mover of the seconder of this, but if I was, I'd be wanting the highest level of protection and I wouldn't just be wanting um, a discussion about an exemption later on. I'd be wanting to have that protection in law. But anyway, it's... It, the the second have indicated they're happy for us to include that okay. into yep. our whole, recommendations. The whole, whole point is putting the cards on the table with okay. Parliament to say um, we're not just a great big city, but there are complications that need to be considered yep. and the element of fairness to communities. Thank you, Councillor Josephine. Councillor Bartley, no, I'm sorry, okay. So I think we've about landed on that. Um, amendment's been withdrawn. We have another amendment from Councillor Newman, and seconded by Councillor Sayers. I propose that that get put up, but we have a five minute break before we hear that. Is that okay? Yes. We stand down for five minutes. Thank you.